this time, we'll walk about Taylor Goheen to share about his mission success. Well, good morning, everyone. It's hard to believe that it was 12 years ago that Abby and I first walked through those doors and first called you guys our church family as we attended school over at uh, what was called New Tribes Bible Institute at the time. Um, but just want to start off and say that it's a privilege to be able to be with you and to share with you. And I really am honored to be able to share with you a little bit of what God has done in and through us in this little corner of the world called Kaje. Um, but first, I've already had some comments about my hair, but I have to say I have an excuse. So six months ago-ish, my hair was starting to get a bit shaggy, and I took a video of myself and sent it to my coworker, who's still over in New Guinea, and I, the message was for the Kaje people. I showed them my hair. I was like, hey, guys, what do you guys think? Should I cut it or leave it? And they said, Taylor, do not cut it. When you come back in August, we'll cut it. <laughs> so I got to leave it. Keep it going. Otherwise, I'll have 400 very disappointed people if I show up with my hair cut. So as I thought about sharing with you this morning, Paul and Barnabas came to mind. After their missionary journey, they gathered the church in Antioch together, and they shared with them all that the Lord had done in and through them among the Gentiles. And I feel a little bit similar this morning. I'm going to be sharing with you guys some of what God has done in the place that we know as Kaje. Also, along with sharing a bit about the Kaje, I want us to remember this morning the task that the Lord has invited us to, to make disciples of all nations, is still unfinished. And so keep that in mind as we roll along. So I know that some of you have been following our story, some of you know us, and some of us maybe not. Maybe this is the first time you've seen me in your life. Um, so just want to say my wife, Abby, and our three kids were here on our scheduled furlough from Papua New Guinea, which is located due north of Australia. It's an island the size of Texas, and it's just a vast, vast jungle, home to hundreds of different villages and literally hundreds of different language groups. So you go to one place, they speak one language, you hike five hours, another place, completely different language, you wouldn't understand a thing, these, these people wouldn't understand a thing that those guys say. So literally hundreds of different languages. And for the past seven years, my wife, three kids, and two other families, I want to throw those up there, Ryan. Uh, maybe not, yeah, that's okay. So for the past seven years, this has been home to us. So if you're a Kaje person, you'd have 5,000 other people in the world that knew and spoke your language. Those would be your friends and your family, and they'd be scattered across nine different villages. If you're a Kaje person, you would live on a food called Sago. I don't have time to explain what it is. After the service, Google, what is Sago, and look it up. It's pretty wild, this food, really like gooey type of food that they eat. If you're a Kaji person, you would have three or four garden, uh, tennis court sized gardens where you'd grow plantains, yams, various greens. Tonight you might be eating grubs with your sack sack or your yams uh, for protein. Tomorrow and the night after that, you probably won't have any protein with your meal. And then the night after that, if you were fortunate enough while you're hunting to shoot a little rodent called a bandicoot, again, Google what a bandicoot is after this, then you would have a little rodent meat with your sack sack or your, your sago. Sorry, that was a pigeon word of it. With your sago or your yams. Also, if you're a Kaji person, you would have an orchard of beetle trees and you would sell that beetle nut for, and get a little money and with that money you would buy some clothes for yourself and your family, a machete to work with, maybe an axe and some bowls, some pots, spoons and things like that. And that would be about the totality of your belongings and how you get that. So you get the picture. 
Kaje is a tribe of people as close as you get to the definition of the word. And seven years ago, my family along, here we go, Ryan, along with two other families moved in. Uh, first, John and Jen on the left there with their couple kids, they first moved in with us. And then three years later, we were joined by Christopher and Lily Meyer. You can do the next picture now. And uh, they're on the left there. So three families have lived there for the last seven years. We initially hiked into each of the nine villages to tell them what we wanted to do and communicate them, like, this is our plan, this is the things we're committed to, and ask them to, is this something you're interested in? So we go through, we had five things that we, we communicated to them using the national language, the five things that we wanted to do. So we went into each of the nine villages and we told them, this is what we got, you got five blah blong him, number one walk blong him, and we blah by landing, top place blue blah, and I'll be slow walk, me blah by landing, you blah, low read and write, low top place blue, you blah yet, and so on and so forth. In the national language, the first thing we want to do is learn your language, build houses, live there, and learn your language. The second thing that we are, are pledging to do is to teach you to read and write your own language, something they didn't have the opportunity to do. They couldn't read and write their own language because their own written language didn't exist at that point. They just spoke it orally. Then we, we said we will also teach you what we refer to as God's talk, the story of the Bible, the story of redemption. And we will also, we pledge that we translate the scriptures into the Kaji language and hand that to them. And then finally, we said the last thing that we want to do is teach you guys how to do this work, to put it in your hands so that you can continue this work on and do it. And seven of the nine villages said, yes, please, we want you to come, please move in. The village that we ended up moving into is 400 people. They were extremely excited. They wanted us very much and said, please come. We want you to do this. We've been waiting for years for someone to come and do such a thing in our village. And so we moved in. For two years, our full-time job was learning their language, learning how they lived, learning how they thought about the world around them. And through the process, we learned to fit in. We earned their trust, and we became friends. To the point where if I went today to visit my friend Guinea, or Wira, or Nyakungwap, they'd be sitting there in their little house and they would see me come in they say, oh, gyan, 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 wigire no no waka. We learned their language and through that process, we became friends. We earned their trust. We formed the Kaji alphabet, which we then learned we used in our literacy school that we had begun. And we taught them to read and to write their own language. And after four years of hard work, much joy, but also much pain, we had the privilege of sharing with them the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. You'll hear a little more about that later. But the question I first want to answer is this. Why would anyone care about sharing the good news about Jesus with a people group like Kaji, or for any other ethnic group for that matter? To answer this question, the story goes way back. If you read in the early chapters of Genesis, you'll find that the story it tells again and again is that the world that God had created, a world filled with peace and harmony, had become a broken, fragmented place. As we read these stories that paint a picture of a world that we all know, that we know all too well, one of blame shifting, deceit, Murder, violence, corruption. You will also find a God who is committed to entering into that brokenness, into that fragment, fragmented world to bring about healing. We also find an interesting dimension to God's efforts to bring about restoration as we read the story. And that is that he works in and through mankind to bring that about. Think about uh, the, what you've been hearing from Pastor Zach in the number of weeks, months, I don't know, about Abraham. Okay, we have a fragmented world, a God committed to bring about restoration, healing to that world, and also a commitment 
to work in and through mankind to bring that about, calls out this man, Abraham, makes a covenant with him so that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And God's commitment to bring about healing to his fragmented world is also highlighted when he leads Abraham's family out of slavery. And he makes another covenant with them that they would be a special people and that he would live among them. And his purpose in doing so was that this nation would be a light to who? To the nations among whom they live. But before long, if you follow the story of the Bible, tells you find this nation that God chose to use as an agent of healing. They find themselves back to the very place that they started, exile as exiled slaves. The rescuers had become the ones in need of rescue. And during this time, individuals known as the prophets, they spoke and wrote about a time that good news would be announced. Good news that God is the king and that he would come and bring about peace and rescue, not only in Israel, but all the way to the ends of the earth. And just at the right time when it seemed that God had forgotten his plan, when it seemed that he abandoned his people, he came, God entered into this fragmented, broken world as a human came in as a human, keeping to his commitment to bring about healing and restoration in and through mankind. Jesus lived here as a human. He taught and announced that the rule of God was near. The time he come, the time had come, the time that they had been waiting for, for generations upon generations past had come, and Jesus came proclaiming it. He says, the time has come, you guys. Great! Deploy Dev Grew. God is the king. Scramble the F-16s. Prime the missiles. God is the king and he's going to bring the hammer. But Jesus, he teaches about a kingdom structure quite differently from the kingdoms of this earth. A kingdom where the weak are elevated where the outcasts are more important. A kingdom where greatness is shown by love, humility, peace, and forgiveness. Jesus taught it, and he also embodied it. Wherever he went, he was the expression of God's kingdom. Like a light breaking into the darkness, he was the embodiment of the healing to the fragmentation. And then the unthinkable the king to be submitted himself to obedience to such a degree that he allowed himself to be killed as a criminal. And as a result, God elevated him above all and gave him the name above all names. So this servant king was God himself, the one who had from generations past been working toward healing to this fragmented world. And he did and does his work with and through mankind. And here, after his most triumphant moment, his death and resurrection, keeping true, remaining true to his character, he commissioned his disciples and said, told them, now go, make disciples of who? All nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all I've commanded you. And now, guess what? I'll be with you. So here we are now, today. We have the privilege of working with God, participating in His plan for light to break through the darkness, to be agents of healing and restoration, like a small mustard seed, maybe. Or like a pinch of yeast in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in the nations beyond. And I want to say this morning, 
that as a small group called MCBC in the middle of Michigan Center, Michigan, or is that where we are, Jackson or Michigan Center? The little group you guys called MCBC in the middle of Michigan Center, Michigan. I want to say that you guys have participated in the gospel, in the light of the gospel, breaking through the darkness amongst the nations. You have participated in the thing that Jesus commissioned his disciples to do. I want to encourage you and say you guys have done well. And say, honestly, good job. Good job. You guys are doing well. Think about, I mean, think about it with me for a moment. The Apostle Paul, he traveled around from town to town, sharing with them the good news about Jesus. And he also helped them organize themselves into formal assemblies. He was, he was a, a church planter. But we know that Paul's work as a church planter wasn't a freelance operation. It wasn't him, you know, going on his own doing his things. Churches like the Philippian church, they supported him both physically and emotionally. And he considered to be such churches partners in his work. And I take my cue in saying this from Philippians. 1, 3 through 5, it says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. Making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. They were like business partners, the different jobs, different roles, but they worked together. They're partners, they're business partners. With one goal, with one aim in mind. And if Paul considered the Philippian church to be his partners, I think that we also can view ourselves in a similar way. Think about the different works that MCBC is involved in around the world on the missions front. Kaja is one of those works. And I want to tell you guys this morning, listen, you guys have permission to say the church that we planted in Kaje. You have permission to say the work that we are involved in in Papua New Guinea. It's not what, it's not my work. It's not Abby's work. It's not the job that John is doing or Jen or Christopher or Lily. This is what we are doing. We are partners in this. You have permission to say the church that we planted in Kaje. And you have permission to smile about that and to celebrate that. Cool. So bring it back around now. What is it that we're partners in? What is it that we have teamed up to do? We are partners in the spread of the gospel, bringing healing to the fragmented world in which we live. In relation to my particular role, we are partners in the gospel bringing healing to the fragmented world of Kaje. And fragmented or broken is the nice way to say it. After moving into Kaje and spending some time with the people on a daily basis, my coworker John and I, we walked down to help, some, help a guy build his house. So bush poles, we go down to help this guy build his house, and a number of people show up to help. If you can picture, you know, village setting, everyone's helping out, pitching in, you're on the right track, you're picturing the right thing. Also, who came along, it's not just adults, but kids come along too, and this is my little buddy, Simbi. I love this guy. He came down there with us, and he was going to help his uncle build the, the house that we were working on. So the house is, we're putting up rafters, and there's a couple packets of nails that they had to nail the rafters up in the ridge pole and down at the bottom. And so nails were going, being passed around. I even had a few in my pocket, and when the guy up top needs a nail, you hand him the nail and he pounds it in. And so that's kind of how it went. Fast forward to the end of the project. I go and sit by Simbi's father, who was also there. It's not his house, it's Simbi's uncle. So I go and sit next to Simbi's father, and we're just relaxing, kind of chilling after the project is done, and here comes Simbi over in a sneaky little manner. He's like looking around like you can tell something's up with this guy. He reaches in his pocket, pulls out 
a small handful of nails that he had stolen from his uncle. Then he glances with his eyes to get his dad's attention. And I'm sitting there like, what's going to happen now? His dad looks at his son and he says, good job. Good job. Quick, put those in your pocket so no one sees them. Congratulating his son for stealing nails from his uncle. He puts them in his pocket and we go home. They had a couple more nails to build their house. Fragmented world in need of healing. One night about 11.30 at night, we're all asleep. I hear our house up on stilts. I hear under my house, my coworker, John, he says, Taylor, Taylor, wake up, wake up. We have a problem. Come down quick. I go down to find Yopringa. You throw up a picture of Yopringa. Yopringa had, had barely stammered up the hill to our house for medical attention. She had thrown a spear at her husband, hit him right here. If it was a little deeper, it would have killed him. He, his machete, cut her in the face, and she was there under our house, a bloody mess with her face hanging off. This is not the cream-coated missionary talk. This is the harsh reality of the world that we have chosen to live in. A world of violence in need of peace. Or the time that Gunge burned his own house down because he was so mad that his sister wouldn't marry the guy that he wanted her to marry. Or the time that one group of the village with spears, bow and arrows, slingshots, machetes are marching to another end of the village to end a feud that had been ongoing for months and months. A world of violence in need of peace. A world of vengeance in need of forgiveness and harmony. Please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that it's bad there and it's good here. I know that horrific things happen here, sometimes in our own neighborhoods. But the purpose, the reason I share these stories with you is so that you don't have a wrong picture of the world that moved into in Kaje. It was not a place of tranquil harmony and peace and oneness with themselves and with the land and kumbaya and... Sometimes it was the complete opposite of those things. But if you allow yourself, if you're willing to step into the muck and to sift through the pain and the hurting and the longing, you will find a beautiful people made in the image of God. For four years, we lived with them. We worked alongside them, and by the grace of God, we earned their trust, and we became friends. In 2019, we communicated with the village that we had prepared enough to share with them the story of the Bible, what we referred to as God's talk. We said, guys, we're ready. Finally, we've been working for years and years now. We're ready to share with you God's talk, and we discussed with them time, where we would meet, how often, how long, and we started to meet with them four days a week for four months, walking through story by story, explaining to them the story of redemption that we know by reading the Bible. Check out this short video that I put together that will help you kind of picture what it was like when we taught a little bit. You'll see, notice it was very interactive, Not like this where I'm here talking and you guys are like silent. Heaven forbid anyone make a comment. That's very interactive. Lots of visual aids, skits. We did all kinds of dramas. And so take a look at this.
light of the gospel had broken into the darkness. I remember one evening, a couple days after you saw in that movie, that skit we did of the crucifixion, I was walking home past Reque and Martina's house. And there was Martina sitting down in front of her house. And I stopped and I asked her, hey, Martina, you've been listening to this teaching. You've heard about Jesus' death, about his resurrection. What do you think? Whose family are you part of right now? Instantly, her eyes, they lit up and she was so happy to tell me. She said, Taylor, I'm in God's family. And I inquired further, like, oh, like, Martina, what makes you say that? Full confidence, Taylor, because I believe in Jesus. Oh, like Jesus died and he just stayed dead. No, he didn't just stay dead. He rose from the grave. The light had dawned in Martina's heart and mind and in the lives of many more. That last picture in that video is the picture of the Kaje church. And the gospel began to reshape their lives. Two friends of mine, Gomo on the left there, Herman on the right. I was at their house one evening. We're working on translating Ephesians together, putting Ephesians to the Kaji language. And we were talking, and they just kind of were starting, you know, just casual conversation. They told me, Taylor, listen, before we heard God's talk, when we'd go hunting, We'd be going through the bush at night, and if bats flew overhead, it would freak us out. We'd bolt as fast as we can running home because we know that if bats flew, fly over your head, that's a bad omen that you are about to get killed with sorcery. Literally killed, and literally is what they're afraid of. And they said, Taylor, and they're laughing at themselves, thinking about, that's what we used to be like. And they said, now? Now, Taylor, we go hunting at night, and if bats fly over our head, we don't care. We just keep going, because we know that God is much stronger than any sorcery that we could encounter. Comfort had come to a world of fear. Another time I was walking home, and across the creek, I could hear my friend Gyor and his daughter Armella singing, just them in their house. He carried our sin and he died. And through his death conquered sin and death song that the Kaji Church has written. Love has come to a world of hate. My, or my friend Yakuwap. This guy, this guy was big, big into sorcery. He'd go out in the bush and do his who knows what's there. And when he was listening to the teaching, it was like there was almost like this fog in this guy's mind. When he's, when he's listening, it's like just everything's going over this guy's head, and you think, what? The, this guy's never going to get it after the lesson you ask him. Hey, Yakuwa, what was that lesson about? And his response, he's like way out in left field, not a clue. Like, he would tell John and I things as we were teaching, like, yeah, when Satan talks to me, he says, dot, dot, dot. And you think about, I think, would think about in Yakuwap as he'd sit there. He'd come every day and sit there. I'd think, how on earth is this guy going to accept the gospel? Not a chance. But even Nyakungwap, of all people, he heard the gospel. His eyes were opened. He believed the gospel. He has been faithful in the church, and even a couple months ago, when our, my coworkers were deciding they were going to leave for a conference to decide who's going to lead the church in the Lord's Supper, they chose Nyakungwa because he's been so faithful and so committed to his faith in the Lord and following Jesus. Or 
Let's see, Bingo, this old guy, this frail old guy. Okay, these are stories that the, the light of the gospel is dawning in the hearts and lives of the Kaji people. This old frail guy, he's a part of the church. He's like hanging on by thread. This guy doesn't have much muscles going on to be able to do anything. And he, he shows up to the, the weekly meeting that they were doing, and he shared with the people that, sorry, this is, I'm hearing this story from my coworkers, so I wasn't there. So he shows up to their weekly meeting, and he shares with the church, he's like, guys, I need to harvest my food. This is hard, hard work. And this guy's arms aren't about to do what he needs to do to harvest his food. He asks the church for help. He says, hey, will you guys help me harvest my food? I can't do it. Never happened in Kaje before that he would ask help from someone other than his family members in his kinship system. But he asked the church for help. 20 or so strong guys, they go down, they harvest his food, they help him out. The light of the gospel is breaking into the darkness of Kaja. Another thing that recently happened in the church is one member of the church needed to settle a past wrong that he had with someone. So he needed a sum of money to be able to something that had happened years ago. And this guy, he had none. He's part of the church. Another person unrelated to the incident, he comes to John and Christopher and the rest of the church. And he says, hey guys, I have an idea. What if we pooled some of our money together to help this guy out? Never happened before in Kaje that someone other than his family would think to help him out with any type of money or anything like that. Then the guy who was offended that needed, they needed this money to right their wrong gets up in a village meeting and says, hey guys, by the way, he's also part of the church, hey guys, by the way, this wrong that happened in the past, it's okay, nothing needs to happen. I forgive him. Never happened before in Kaje. Forgiveness instead of revenge. Love instead of hate. And why do I share these stories with you? Because these are stories that you have been partners in. You are not bystanders, but you are participants in all this. You have done well, MCBC. Good job. Good job. You have participated in the light of the gospel going through the nations abroad. You've done well, but it doesn't mean, okay, now I get to retire. The Kaje people have heard the gospel. <sighs> Let's sit back and relax. Think back to Jesus' mandate to his disciples. He told them, go make disciples of who of all nations. Teaching them to do what? Teaching them all that I have commanded you. Think of another thing Jesus said. This commandment I give you to love one another. So here we are with the commission to go teach what Jesus taught to all the nations. And what he taught was love. Now put that in the context of the Kaje people. These guys are infants. They're babies in practicing love. They're not used to doing it. They don't know how in many ways to do it. Along with these stories that I just shared with you, they're cause for celebration and rejoicing. I can tell you an equal amount of stories of pain and sorrow within the church. Like Nanjara, who a couple months ago took a tree branch and broke it over her husband's head. Or Skeeta, who bit the finger off of Bunna. Or Ngunjiri, who was so mad at his mother-in-law that he threw a spear at her right in front of my eyes. Thankfully, he missed. You see, 
The Kaji people, they've heard the gospel, but the job is not finished. It's merely begun. It's merely begun. And what do they need? More teaching? More instruction? Listen, you guys, quit that. Stop, stop doing that to each other. The Bible says, is that what they need? Or do they need someone to take their hand and to walk with them, showing them, hey, there's a different way. There's a different direction to go. The Jesus way. Let's go together. Not that I have it all figured out. Not that I know the way. Hey, let's figure this out together. Let's do this together as we follow Jesus into a new way to be human. I hope you see the core of my message and my urge for us today. Our work in Kaje is an ongoing work. It's an ongoing work that we as a church are partners in, but it's, and it's unfinished. So you have done well. You have done, you have done good work in participating in the commission that Jesus gave his disciples. You have done well. Keep it up. There's still work to do. Let's continue to partner together to finish the work that we have begun in Kaje. Let's continue to partner together as we finish the other works that MCBC is, are, is also, are also partnered with. If we fly up and look at this task of making disciples of all nations and look at the task from 30,000 feet, we'll find that the job is still un finished. Even in our little corner of the world in Kaji, there's people that come on a semi-regular basis from other tribes. They come and they ask us, Taylor, John, Christopher, Abby, Jen, whoever, they don't care who's there. They said, when are we going to get missionaries that come and live in our village and learn our language and do what you guys are doing in Kaji? We have done well. Keep it up. There's still work to be done. There's still work to do. In fact, sometimes I feel like, what good can I do? One person here on the earth, or one small church. I mean, do some YouTube searches. Check out the state Venezuela's been in. Political biases aside, think about the people. So much pain, so much hurt, so much suffering. So much hurting, so much brokenness. And sometimes I can feel like, what good can I do? And it can feel like a little drop in the bucket. Yeah, this job, making disciples of all nations, is bigger than any of us. It can feel like 12 guys standing in the shadow of over 5,000 people, holding a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, less than a drop in the bucket. But then Jesus takes what little they have gives thanks for it, breaks it, gives it back and says, you feed them. The light of the gospel is breaking into the darkness. God is building his kingdom and he takes what little we have, gives thanks for it, breaks it, says, It'll be enough. Gives it back to us and says, you feed them. We're invited to partner together to participate in the disciples being made of all nations. And I can't tell you what that means for you. 
Lord, I can't ask you to think, to consider, to ponder, maybe even to dream what it might look like for you in your life. Church, you have done well. You have done well. Keep it up. The job is still unfinished. Thanks, guys, for giving me your time and your attention. Thank you.